As we gather today for the enlightening series, The Gospel Through the Sanctuary, it is my esteemed pleasure to introduce to you a man whose life story is as dynamic and profound as the message he brings. Evangelist Dwayne Lemon, an embodiment of dedication and purpose, has traveled an extraordinary path to stand before us today. In his early days, Dwayne was renowned for his exceptional dance and choreography, captivating audiences around the world. A personal tragedy later in life propelled him into a period of deep introspection. Through God's providence, he stumbled upon a flyer for Bible meetings which marked the beginning of a spiritual journey. This path ultimately led him to find solace and a deep-rooted connection with Jesus Christ. Today, as an ordained leader in the Adventist Church, Evangelist Lemon stands as a beacon of hope, inspiration, and spiritual guidance. His dedication extends beyond the pulpit, as he also serves as the director of PTH Ministries, a Bible-based ministry committed to preaching, teaching, and healing. His travels across continents to preach the gospel have not only widened his horizons, but have also strengthened his belief that, irrespective of geography or culture, the human heart yearns for a genuine, dynamic relationship with God. His conviction is that the harmonious blend of the three angels' messages and practical medical missionary work is key to unlocking this spiritual bond. Above all, Evangelist Lemon's heart beats with a singular passion to inspire the young and the inexperienced to discover the joy and fulfillment of a life wholly devoted to Jesus Christ. As a testament to his personal life, he cherishes his bond with his wife Alexandra and their four children, Jared, Kayla, Caleb, and Jada. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Evangelist Dwayne Lemon. Absolute privilege to be here with you all as I consider myself your brother, so I always like to introduce myself as I'm your brother Dwayne. And uh, you are my brothers and sisters, in case you haven't noticed. And I'm absolutely privileged to be here with you all as we study God's wonderful words of life together. And over the past week, we have been going through a series, The Gospel Through the Sanctuary. We've been looking at something that the world at large is very familiar with, which is something called the gospel. But what we have done is we have presented it with great specificity, looking at the gospel through the sanctuary. And we were learning some wondrous things out of God's word. And today, I cannot stress how excited I am to share with you something very special about my best friend and my Savior, Jesus Christ. And I want you to see something very special as we look at another aspect of the gospel that quite honestly um, is, the, you know, it, it's as um, was mentioned earlier by Brother Paul, that it was always there. It was always there in Scripture. But somehow we kind of missed some of these things. So I'm going to share something with you that might seem unfamiliar, but I can assure you it is thoroughly biblical. More importantly, I pray that healing grace will shower all over us. And this is the great work that God wants to do right now. He wants to heal us from the, wound, the wounds that sin has inflicted in our lives and in our hearts. And so as we prepare to go through our study today, I'm going to have a word of prayer. I'm going to kneel to do that, and I'm just going to ask you to please bow your heads with me. But let's pray together and ask God, especially to prepare our hearts to receive the word. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we are ever so grateful. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for blessing us to make it safely through another week. We thank you, dear God, to have an opportunity to honor you on this precious day. And Lord, it's our desire that we may come to understand the one whom you sent, that he died, that we might live. That name is Jesus. 
Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus that you will please send your Holy Spirit, not merely in the building, but in our hearts, and that you might open our eyes and help us behold wondrous, wondrous things out of your word. And I pray that we will leave here different than when we came in, for we have climbed one more round higher on Jacob's ladder, ultimately to arrive in the arms of Christ. This is our prayer that we ask with the forgiveness of our sins. In Jesus' name, let everyone say, amen. Amen. Last uh, study, we looked at the courtyard, and we were talking about the subject of the Lamb of God. That, that very term that the, the baptizer, John, said when he said, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. That was not just merely a fact, but it was also, it was sanctuary language. Because in the Bible, in that courtyard, that is where the Lamb dies. And tonight we're going to talk about that, because tonight we're going to move into the holy place, and we're going to talk about the holy place experience. And there's going to be some deep things from the Word of God that we will see this evening. But here it is that when we behold that Lamb of God, the thing that, th there was a reason that John the baptizer told us to behold the lamb. And this was the reason. The Bible made it very clear. It says, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, behold the lamb of God, which does something. What does he do? He takes away the sin of the world. This, this is what made uh, Jesus worthy to behold. It wasn't like John was just saying, behold him, because there was lots of men around. But there was a special mission that Christ had. You see, I want you to take your Bibles with you and go to the book of Matthew chapter 1. In Matthew, the first chapter, we see, according to the Word of God, the mission of Christ. When, when he came to this world. Now, I often, when I teach, I teach that Jesus came for three reasons, but I'm just going to emphasize on one right now. In Matthew chapter 1, you will see that the Bible is very clear on why Christ came to this world. And the Bible says in the book of Matthew, we're considering chapter 1, and we're going to look at verse 21. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21. The Bible says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from what? From their sins. Now, how is he going to do this? According to the verse, it says he's going to take it away. He's going to take it away. But do you know something I learned about Jesus? Jesus is a gentleman. Do you believe that? Oh, yes, I know that to be a fact. That's why I want to be like him so badly, because I'm a man and I want to be gentle. And so here it is that when I look at Jesus, I see the, the perfect pattern of what it is to be a gentleman. Now, when a gentleman wants his woman, I want to, you know, let's drop some education, some true education. You know, when a man wants his woman, when he eventually finds her, he has one of two choices. He can bust the door open and say, woman, I'm here. And he can go ahead and just take her. But I'm so glad that that's not the example that Jesus left for me. For the Bible says in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, he says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. Did you know that's what a gentleman does? A gentleman knocks and he waits to be entered in. And so it is that when Jesus, he stands at your heart's door, he stands at my heart's door. So this idea that you're reading on the screen, this Lamb of God that takes away, we have to understand that while it sounds aggressive, it must first be permissive. You see, he stands at the door and knocks, and he waits for you to give him permission to take away the sin of the world. And this is the great work that Christ is doing right now. He's always knocking on humanity's heart saying, will you let me in? That's what Jesus said to me 31 years ago. Will you accept me now, Dwayne? Will you let me in? And when I made the decision to let him in, boy, did my life change. And so can yours. The Bible is very clear that Christ came to eradicate sin once and for all. Now, there are three ways that Jesus goes about the eradication of sin. Some things are immediate. Some things are daily. And some things are still waiting for the future. What do I mean by that? Well, if you study the Bible carefully, you will see that there are three things about sin that Christ wanted to deal with. Number one, he wanted to address the penalty of sin. Number two, he wanted to address the power of sin. 
And then number three, he wanted to address the presence of sin. When we accept Christ, you see, in the sanctuary, we learn, not through the sanctuary, but specifically the courtyard, which leads to the sanctuary, we learn that there's a lamb that dies, and he takes the place of the guilty party. There's a transfer. We receive its innocence. It receives our guilt. And in that transaction that takes place, If you and I, by faith, put our trust in Jesus, confess our sins, and make a decision to turn away from all things. I thought about a person one time, I was was talking with them about surrendering their heart to Christ. And they said, well, what if I sin again? I said, don't worry, God has plenty of power to address that. I said, but what we need to know is, are you willing right now today to forsake all sin? Are you willing to do that today? The day that I said, 26 years ago, I said, I do, to a very precious lady. You know what I'm saying? I looked her right in the eyes, and the person asked me, do you promise to love and cherish and all these other things till death do you part? And I looked her right in the eyes, and I said, I do. Now, could I have failed within those 26 years? Sure, I could have, but thank the Lord. You know, sometimes I have brothers come to me, and Dwayne, you've been with your wife for 26 years, man. Haven't you cheated on her at least once? Come on, bro. Keep it real. All of us mess up a little something, something. And I was just like, Well, I said, I have to admit, I said, after 26 years, I said, I've been with this many women. And he was like, and I said, hold on, hold on, keep looking. Then I went like this. Then I went like that. And he was like, you mean to tell me you've been with not even one woman for 26 years of marriage? All that international and national traveling, you could have done anything you wanted to. You didn't cheat on your wife, not once. And I was like, thank God, no. And then when they said, was it for lack of opportunity? I was like, absolutely not. There's a lot of uh, interesting women in the church. Yeah, there's some, there's some interesting sisters in the church. I said, it wasn't because of lack of opportunity. They said, well, how could you say no when you're around such beautiful women from all over the planet? I said, well, very, I said it's very simple. It's four words. And they was like, what's the four words? I was like, love makes it easy. You will find that love makes it easy to say no, even to temptations. And as it is true in our earthly marriages, so it is true in our heavenly marriage. And God wants us to understand that in our walk with Christ, that Lamb of God, Jesus says, when you accept me by faith, he says, the first thing I'm going to do immediately is he says, I am going to immediately cancel the penalty of sin. That's why for those of us who took our stand for Christ the other night and said, Lord, I choose to accept this Lamb that died on my behalf. Do you understand you instantly pass from death to life? I always like to let people know, I think that's great news. That's not even good news. That's great news. So the penalty of sin is immediate. Once you accept Christ, the penalty has been removed. But now every day we got to walk with the Lord. And every day that we walk with the Lord, now Jesus is going to daily deliver us from the power of sin. And that's why for those of us who have been walking with the Lord for a little while, you can remember stuff you did some months ago or years ago that you don't do anymore. You may not be perfect, but you're better than who you were. That testifies to the power of God, God's power to deliver us from sin daily. He's daily delivering us from the power of sin. And that's why the holy place study we're going to do tonight is so important. I'm going to show you practically how God helps us daily walk in the life of overcomers. But even when he delivers us from the penalty, and even when he delivers us from the power, we still are in the presence of sin, aren't we? We still see its ugly effect on humanity. We see it in disease. We see it in death. We see it in suffering. We see it in rape. We see it in extortion. We see it in prostitution, in pornography. We see it in all the evils that goes on in this world. But Jesus made a promise in Revelation 21. Jesus made a promise that a time will come where there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more sin. Why? Because he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And Nahum chapter 1 and verse 9 says, affliction, which is synonymous to sin, will not rise a second time. 
God says we will be delivered from the presence of sin, but that's still future. So when we look at the beautiful plan of salvation and we watch how it's unfolded throughout the sanctuary, we're seeing that there are some effects of it that happens immediately. There's some effects of it that happens daily. And then there's another final effect of it that we all have a wonderful looking forward to the glorious future. Now, when it comes to Jesus delivering us from the power of sin, I want to talk about that today. When it comes to Christ delivering us from the power of sin, you see, I'm, I'm not a fool. I, I, you know what I do more than preaching? You want to know what I do more than teaching? Counseling. Counseling. My phone is a worldwide number. And up until this morning, Brother Lawrence from Africa is preparing to fly over to the U.S. to meet, we, meet with me in January so he can go under some tutelage. And I get Facebook Messenger, Instagram messages, text messages, WhatsApp, emails galore, and phone calls on a daily basis. I have 2,417 emails that I've still yet to respond to. And there are people all over saying, my life, my marriage, my this, my that is in trouble. How could you help me? Could you please help me? So lots and lots of counseling. And one of the things I realize is that a lot of God's people are not really broken because of lack of knowledge, but lack of power. Like there are people right now who might reach out to me and say, I have a problem with pornography. Do I need to educate them that watching pornography is wrong? No, they already know. But why are they still going to? Because they're lacking power to resist it. There are some individuals who say, I don't know how to get along with my parents. I just don't like them. Do you think that I need to educate them that you are called to honor your father and your mother and to love them? They already know that but they're lacking power to execute. There are husbands and wives that are like, look, I am so sick of this woman, and I'm so sick of this man. I am ready to take off. And this is after 20 and 30 and 40 years of marriage. There are three types of marriages. Enjoy, endure, and escape. And there are a lot of people you know where the majority of many marriages are? Endure. I endure my husband. There's things about him that I don't like, and I don't know how long I can stay with him, but I'm enduring it for now. There's things about my wife. Can't stand it. Had I saw it earlier on, probably wouldn't have even said I do. But too late, I'm here. And they say, and, and I endure her. There are very few marriages that in, are in the enjoy stage. Very few, but that's where God wanted me. And so, boy, do I get, I mean, I get tons. My, I have a lot of my messages online, and, and, and one of my burdens in life is the family. That's one of my great burdens in life is the family. So I have a lot of messages on the last days, family, prophecy, and the power of God. I do a lot of messages on that. So a lot of people call me and say, hey, how can I have those things you're talking about become a reality in my home? Now, do I go to those husbands and say, did you know you're supposed to love your wife? You think he didn't know that? He already knew it. You go to the wife and say, do you remember the covenant you made to love him and to cherish him for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to death do you part? Did you forget that? She's like, I know it. Well, why aren't you doing it? Because I'm lacking power. So again, I am convinced at this state in life, there's a lot of people bound by a lot of sins, a lot of problems, a lot of stuff that the power is there for them to be healed. But somehow they don't know how to connect into it. I remember when I lost my mind. That was a very, very rough period of my life. I literally felt like demons were controlling me. I was in a different place, in a different state of mind, and I was a bona fide mess. And I can remember that, 
you know, I would talk to people about how I knew stuff. Man, people would give me verses and I could finish the verse before they finish it. I didn't have a problem with my memory. I've memorized a lot of verses over these years. I memorized a lot of quotes from the inspired writings all these years. I know a lot. I'd, I'd, I'd be a liar, be false humility for me to act like I'm dumb. I know I'm not dumb. It's like, I know a lot. There's a lot that I've studied and exposed myself to, but I found myself powerless. When it just came to certain things that were binding me, I was like, I have no power against this. And so I'm telling you from my own personal experience, as well as the realities of talking with others, there are a lot of people that know what to do. They know what is right, but we are lacking power to execute. And it's keeping us in a nasty bondage and we're not experiencing the peace that Jesus came to give. Literally, I was counseling with one of my friends. He was like a counselor to me. And, and he said, Dwayne, he said, what is it that you want? This is when I was going through my mental health crisis. He said, Dwayne, what do you want? I said, I want peace. I said, I want peace. I don't have peace. And I remember he said, well, why don't you just take it? And I was like, what are you talking about? And he was like, according to what I read, Jesus said, my peace I leave with you. He left it. So why aren't you taking it? And that put my mind in a train of thinking that today I stand before you 100% restored, 100% healed. And that's why I've dedicated the rest of my life to God, that while I'll preach his word and teach his word and all of that, I'm, I'm in the process right now of setting up a facility to help minister to people with broken minds. It's a very special burden on my heart, okay? But I'm telling you, this message that we're about to go through right here, there's some healing in this message. Now watch this. I began to look at God and say, all right, Lord, what, how are you going to take away my sin when these sins are binding me, when I feel so bound by it, when I feel so entrapped by it? To hate others, even in your heart while you smile in their face, is sinful. God will never let you in his house. God won't let you and won't let me. No actors are in his house. I don't know if you ever read uh, Matthew 23, where Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees. And he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. I'm a very studious person. One day I went to the word hi hypocrite and I looked it up in the Greek. The word hypocrite in the Greek means actor. That blew my mind. Christ was like, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. You're a bunch of actors. He said to them in John 5 and verse 42, he says, I know that the love of God is not in your heart. Christ said that to these brothers. Man, that would have made my knees knock. Can you imagine Jesus coming to you as a leader in his church? And Jesus comes to you and says to you as a leader, I know you. And I know that the love of God is not in your heart. Piercing words. God wants us to understand the sooner, like I showed you the other night, the sooner we recognize our brokenness, and stop trying to act like you cool and you got it all together. The sooner we recognize our great need for the Savior, Jesus has no problem delivering us. The frustration of Jesus right now in delivering his people is, if you remember the other night, I told you it's that one word called cooperation. We have to cooperate with God. We have to recognize, Lord, I need some help. Now you watch the statistics I'm going to show you in this study. And, and, and you'll see that this is very relevant to those of us who are in the room. Now, how is Christ going to take away my sin when I'm so bound by it? Well, this is an image of a heart covered in a lot of stone. Hard heart, right? Hard head, hard head. The Bible, when it talks about the word heart, a lot of times it's talking about the mind, okay? That's what my mother used to always say, hard head makes up behind and I was just like, Mom, hard head. But do you know what Jesus says as a solution for the hard heart, the stony heart? Jesus says, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away. That's the other time you see God saying he's going to take away something. First, he said, I'll take away your sin. But now what does he say? How is he going to take away our sin? Look what it says. He says, I will take away the stony heart. 
and then I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. And that is how God takes away your sins. God does not take away your sin and take away my sin just by simply causing us to enter into a world of behavior modification. Listen carefully what I'm saying. Listen, I know right now the message I'm giving is very deep. It's very deep. I don't know if you'll receive it that way, but I know heaven has already told me. It's very deep what I'm sharing. And you need to be praying, Lord, give me ears to hear what your spirit is saying to me. God cannot deliver you and God cannot deliver me by us just hearing what God says and then entering into a world of behavior modification. Okay, I used to do bad, now I'm going to do good. You ever did something, did you know a preacher can even preach and baptize people with a corrupt motive? Everybody else would say, man, praise the Lord for this minister. Look at him. He just baptized 50 people. And instead of him caring about the souls, he's caring about how, as a result of baptizing 50 people in the, in the crusade, I will now get a higher position at another church and get a bigger church. Good work. Bad motive. A husband can come home and tell his wife, honey, I just want you to know I appreciate you. I love you. I think you just do all things well. Great words. But maybe he's saying it because he wants to get something from her later on. In other words, he's manipulating. He's not saying it because it's genuine in his heart. He's saying good words with a very selfish motive. People, one of the hardest verses of the Bible to believe is Jeremiah 17, 9. Let's turn there. I want you to see what the Bible, I believe this is one of the hardest verses in all the Bible to believe. One of the hardest verses. Not for everyone, but for a great majority of us, I believe. Oh, yes. Jeremiah 17. In Jeremiah 17 and verse 9, I want you to watch what the Bible says. Jeremiah 17, and verse 9, now, you know, Jeremiah is the prophet of God, and what he's saying is the truth. And he says in Jeremiah 17 and verse 9, he says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Question. If I came to your house one day, not me, let's say a person came to your house. They knock on your house, your door. They say, hello. You say, who is it? They say, hello. They said, I just want you to know I'm deceitful above all things. And I am desperately wicked, but I, I came here to give you some advice on how to manage your money. Would you let that person manage your money? Okay, so let's say they knock on your door again. Hello, uh, I am deceitful above all things, and I'm desperately wicked. I'd like to show you how to have a successful marriage. Would you listen to that marriage counseling? No, you wouldn't. All right, one last one. Somebody says, hello, I am deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Let me show you how to be a good parent. Would you listen to that person? No, but the problem is, is we behold that person every day. Every day we look in the mirror, God is talking to us. He's saying, listen, you can't trust your heart. Have you ever, have you ever heard somebody say, God knows my heart? I agree, he knows our heart so well, he wrote about it. And we just read it. Our hearts, it's, I'm telling you, it's a hard verse to believe. God knows this. Those wise ministers, we know it. It's a hard verse to believe. You don't want to know why? Here's one of the signs that we begin to believe Jeremiah 17, 9. Can I show you a sign real quick? Here's a sign that we, begin, we believe Jeremiah 17, 9. I need to buy some clothes. Wait. Before I buy it, let me see what God says about it, because I can't trust my own heart. What's another sign? I need to eat some food because I'm hungry. Wait, before I do it, let me open up God's word. Let me see what God says about what I should be feeding his temple, because my heart's deceived. I'm lonely, and I want a spouse. I want a partner in my life. Let me just go find the next cute or handsome whatever person, and da-da-da. Wait. Let me see what God says should be the principles of guiding me on how to enter into a relationship because my heart is deceived. 
Are you getting where I, what I'm trying to say, beloved? If we're really converted, if we really get what God is saying, you will make far less ultimately no decisions that are just your opinion. Because you understand you don't consult with someone who is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. There are many things that Jesus was to us, beloved, but one thing he was not was a comedian. You know what a comedian does for a living? They tell jokes. And in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4, when Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, he was not joking when he said that. It's a hard life to live, but it's the most rewarding life to live. Live by the word. Now watch this. I began to wonder, Lord, you're going to take this mind of mine and you're going to somehow break away, or not even break away, you're going to take away the stony heart and you're going to do a transplant. You're going you're to give me this, this heart of flesh, this heart of flesh, a heart that's sensitive to life. How are you going to do this? Because if there's one thing that I realize that keeps a lot of us bound, that the Lamb of God came to deliver us from. You know what it is? Childhood traumas. Stuff we went through. You were innocent. You didn't ask for it. But it happened. Something typically in our childhood that hit us. I always thought about it. Why is it that Rehoboam started to do all this evil in the, amongst the days of the children of Israel. Probably, probably because of what he saw happening with his dad, Solomon. Why is it that Ammon did so much evil in the Bible? Probably because of his father, Manasseh. Why is it that Hophni and Phinehas did so much evil probably because of the indulgence and neglect of their father, Eli. This stuff that you and I either were neglected on in, in our youth or stuff that happened to us in our youth. And what ends up happening is we don't know how to deal with it. It's very overwhelming. And then there are thoughts, yea, voices we begin to hear in our head and we begin to believe what we're hearing in our head, and we start acting it out. There are some of us who might have had great childhood, but eventually went through adult trauma. Maybe you had a great childhood. Maybe there wasn't a lot of drama at all. But then all of a sudden, in your adult years, some crazy stuff happened. Some nasty stuff happened. And when that crazy or that nasty stuff happened, it affected us. You married a guy, you thought he was great. One day you got into an argument and he did something you never thought he would do. He lifted up his hand toward you. Maybe he hit you. That's trauma. Just saying, that, that's, that's traumatic. And there's a lot of thoughts that start coming in. Well, maybe, I, I've actually met a lot of sisters who actually said, it's my fault. I thought to myself, Lord have mercy. Your man punches or slaps you and you actually believe it was your fault. Wow. I had to counsel somebody on that just two weeks ago. She actually said, it's my fault. I said, it is not your fault. I said, don't ever let those words come out of your mouth ever again. I said, an enemy told you that. There is never an excuse for a man to lift up the hands that he was called to bless you with, and now he's cursing you by hitting you. Yes, you might have been disrespectful. Even if you said something wrong, it did not merit him hitting you. We got to get that stuff out of our heads. When I was in Michigan and I did an evangelism series, it was in a thoroughly black community. And I remember that this black sister came over. She was a little older. And she told us about her husband and how he cheats on her. And he said, she said, you know how these men are. And my wife got in. My, my wife jumped in on that. She said, oh, no, 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 no. She said, uh-uh-uh. 
You don't demean yourself like that. It is not how these men are. First of all, my man ain't like that. Secondly, secondly, you don't deserve that. That was wrong, and it was inexcusable what he did. We have lowered our standards so much, beloved, that nowadays we even accept abuse and we call it normal. That, that's, that's how messed up our society is, okay? And believe me when I say an enemy have done this. But here's the question. What's the effect of this? How does this tie into the gospel and all these other things? <laughs> Y'all buckle up. You get ready. I'm going to show you some sweet things from the world. This thing dealing with trauma is a very serious issue. This is a little uh, breakdown right here. And I, I have the ability to magnify. Let me see. I don't know if, can y'all see that? No, you can't. Okay. Anyhow, I'm going to read what it says in this little paragraph. Trauma. I'm just going to define trauma, okay? Um, the National Council for Mental Health, Mental Wellbeing is, is the source. I'll put the website up in a second. It says trauma occurs when a person is overwhelmed by events or circumstances and responds with intense fear, horror, and helplessness. It says extreme stress overwhelms the person's capacity to cope. Okay, this is the, the, the simplicity of this term called trauma. Now, these are some, you know, statistics, as you can see, 223.4 million people. This is in the U.S., but British Columbia is, is just as westernized as the U.S., so, you know, you, you more than likely have similar stats, especially having no sun uh, or hardly getting sunlight. Because I, I literally asked somebody, I said, you guys don't get a lot of sunlight. Said, Making me miss home. And, and they said, yeah, 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 it's just like that. I said, you must have high levels of depression and anxiety out because I used to live in New England. If you know anything about the New England states, don't get a whole lot of sunlight, a lot of clouds and all that stuff. What do you see statistically? Lots of depression, lots of anxiety, lots of mental health disorders because of the lack of the sunlight. When the sunlight shines on your eyes, it sends through the pineal gland something called serotonin. That serotonin rises. Serotonin's nickname is the happy hormone. So if you see a lot of unhappy people out here, bring some sunshine in their life. Now watch this. In public behavioral health, over 90% of clients have experienced trauma. I mean, trauma is unfortunately something that churches are not very well informed on. They don't know how to deal with it. We say things like, God will take care of it. Just pray about it. Don't worry, just get over it. That, you, you, you gotta pray for those precious souls that say that. They just don't know. Don't condemn them. They, you know, ignorance is popular. And I used to be ignorant. So, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm just saying. It's like there's a, there, sometimes we just didn't know. So we used to say stuff like, oh, just, just pray about it. Oh, just let the Lord. And, and, and listen, um, you know, there's a lot of us who are black folks in this room. I, I got something just for you because we need to talk. I got something for everybody, but there's something we need to talk about. You see, that's the website if you want to, you know, take a picture and look it up. But here's the thing. Trauma affects our religion. It affects our walk with God. It affects our ability to believe. This is why this needs to be talked about. I can't wait to share the best part of the message. Now, the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs says it like this. For others, trauma can be associated with loss of faith. Don't lose that. Diminished participation in religious or spiritual activities. Changes in belief. Feelings of being abandoned or even punished by God. And loss of meaning and purpose for living. Literally, people go through certain traumatic experiences, and one of the responses is, if God is so good, why did he let that happen to me? and it changes their relationship with God. It changes their belief. It sometimes causes them to say, I don't even know if I'm really interested in church anymore. Because again, they went through trauma, they're not being ministered to, they're being told shallow things like just pray about it, don't worry about it, you'll get over it in time, which is 100% not accurate. 
And after a while, people are like, my trauma is controlling me. So here we are telling people, why don't you just surrender to God? You heard the Bible. You've been to five gospel, uh, gospel through the sanctuary messages. Why aren't you surrendering to Christ? And they're because a lot of them are like, my trauma is not dealt with. There's something I went through that I need some help. If God is so good, why? Why? You know, there are certain, you know, there are certain um, people who believe. You ever heard somebody say this? Don't question God. You ever heard that? Don't question God. I, I, I heard people say that. They say, don't question God. And in my mind, I'm saying to myself, I guess you're more holy than Jesus. Because last I checked, when Jesus was on the cross, he said, my God, my God, what's the next word? Why? That word indicates he's questioning God. Why are you telling people don't question God when even Jesus questioned God? It's not that we tell them don't question God. What we do is we guide them on how to question God. But it's all right to go to God with some of your deep, heart-rooted questions. Well, let's look at some more. In the black community, especially, uh, there's, there's a lot to be learned. Did you know a trend in black families, now watch this, especially the silent generation and what's called baby boomers. Now, what are these groups? What are the age groups? Those born between 1925 and 1945 are what's called the silent generation. If you're born between 1925 and 1945, that generation is classified as the silent generation. Then if you're born between 1946 and 1964, that's called the boomers. That's called the baby boomers, especially amongst the silent generation and especially amongst the baby boomers. Let's notice some facts. Number one, the growing mental illness bias that is in the black community. And this is good for everybody, though, even if you're not black. Watch this. We know that mental health affects the black community in unique ways, often making it challenging for individuals to discuss the issues they are facing and seek the treatment they need. A recent study found that 63% of black people view a perceived mental health condition as a sign of personal weakness. That's why in certain black communities, especially Caribbean, especially Caribbean, we don't talk about it, especially men, because if we do, it's going to make me feel or believe that I'm less a man. An enemy told you that. Brothers, it's a slick, disgusting, slithery, demonic serpent that's telling you that. And you know why? Because he's determined to steal your joy he is determined to kill you and to rob you of any of your peace and destroy you. So he wants you to just keep it in. The number one formula for depression is isolation. Anybody who's in the health work knows that. That's the way the devil gets you. You get all depressed and messed up and you start isolating. You don't talk to anybody, you don't tell anybody anything, and now it's just you and the demons. And last I checked, the demons have been around for millennia, so they're way stronger than me. You can't beat them. And so nowadays we're seeing all these brothers going around killing themselves and doing all sorts of crazy stuff. And we're like, what happened? They were such a good, upstanding individual. It's like, well, there's a lot. Let's continue. It says the cultural stigma, the cultural stigma around mental health results in people bottling up their emotions and refusing to speak freely, even to friends or family fearful of how they will be perceived. Talk about black pride. This is black pride at its highest. You scared of how your family gonna look at you. You scared of how people gonna look at you because you gotta keep it looking together. So here you are, you could die a premature death and they'll put on your tombstone. Died early, but he was cool. That's the legacy we wanna leave? I gotta make sure everybody sees me as cool. So I'm not saying nothing even though I'm going through hell. This is why a lot of people are not getting the victories. They got demons going on. They're dancing in their heads. And Jesus is like, hey, go to Luke 5 and verse 17. Th did you know that what we're about to read in Luke 5 
is actually true right now today, October, what's today's date, 20th? Today the 20th? October 20, 2023. What you're about to read in Luke 5 is true. Look at this, Luke 5. This is true right here in this building on October 20th, 2023. 21st, thank you. October, it was true on uh, yesterday too, but October 21st. So watch this, all right? Luke, we're going to the Gospel of Luke. I want you to see this, Luke 5, and we're going to look at verse 17. This is true today. Luke, the fifth chapter and the 17th verse. I love talking about these because I know the power that it has. I don't like talking about stuff when I don't know anything about his power. But this right here, I know the power behind this. In Luke 5 and verse 17, the Bible says, And it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And how does it close? And the power of the Lord was what? Present to heal them. You know what's sad? is the doctors of the law and the Pharisees received no healing, though the power was right there. It is possible to be in the presence of power for healing and leave without healing. I don't want that for any of us in this room. Now let's continue with this. The National Alliance on Mental Illness also conducted a survey to determine their level of comfort when it comes to discussing mental health related issues, which revealed another troubling disparity. Here's what it was. While 67% of people who identified as white reported feeling open to discussing their mental health issues with close friends and family, only 12.5% of those who identified as black felt the same way. This disparity could be explained by numerous factors such as racial wealth gap, health provider bias, inequality of care, and the list just goes on and on. This is why it's impossible for me to be a black man and not have a burden for the black community. While I have a burden for everywhere, I've, I've preached to hundreds of thousands of, of brethren from European descent and Asian descent and otherwise. So I got love for everybody. That's not an issue. But I have to acknowledge the fact that in the black community, there's certain things that need to be addressed that the average minister who believes present truth is not addressing. And if God has given me this understanding, I already know what's up. When God gives me understanding on something, he did not give it to me to keep it to myself. He gave it to me to give. All right? So it's my burden. So I started to look at this. We are a group of traumatized people. It may not be you specifically. I'm just saying we talking about us humanity collectively. I'm just saying a lot of us have gone through some nasty stuff. And even though we kind of moved on with life and kind of learned how to live through the process, at the end of the day, we are still bound by certain things. Some of us are still like, I will never trust a certain person ever again. I will never trust a man again. That's trauma talking. Your trauma is controlling you. It's different than setting up boundaries. If it'd be one thing if you say, the next time I talk to a man, I will be more mindful of A, B, and C. That's wisdom. That's healing. Because what's happening is you're setting up boundaries. And you're paying attention to, okay, here's what happened in the past. I just want to make sure I don't err on these sides anymore. That's good. That's healthy. But when we make general sweeping rules, like I'm not going to talk with men anymore, that's your trauma. Your trauma is controlling you still. I'm not going to trust women anymore. Your trauma is controlling you. I don't trust preachers anymore. Your trauma is controlling you. Whenever we start making these generalizations and all this other stuff, we're testifying it still controls us. I, I don't know how many of you might be wealthy in this room, right? Like maybe you have rental properties, you know, stuff like that. But um, here's one thing I do know. If you have a rental property and if your tenant doesn't pay rent, what do we need to do with them? We need to evict them, right? Because there's no way you're going to live in my rental property rent free. Is that okay? Is that, is that the right way of thinking? Oh, yeah, I agree with you. So why do you keep letting people who wounded you live in your mind rent-free? It's time to evict them. Are you following that, beloved? As it is in the natural, it needs to be in the spiritual. Don't let people, these people moved on with their, they wounded you, and then they moved on with their lives, and they're living life and enjoying everything. And here we are, 
destitute, broken, we can't do anything, etc. We are letting them live in our minds completely rent free. They need an eviction notice. Now watch this. Negative health impacts of unresolved trauma. You look down at the bottom of the pyramid. The first thing that happens, the adverse childhood experience. That's the bad thing. Whatever that traumatic bad thing was, right? Adverse childhood experiences. Then what happens next? The next bar, social, emotional, and cognitive impairment. Something in you. Health behaviors. We start doing stuff that even mom and dad are like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? You never did this before. What are you doing this for? So now these risky health behaviors come in. Long term, sometimes acute, but long term, you keep doing it. The next bar before the top, disease, disability, and social problems kick in. You start getting sick. And then last is not just death, but what kind of death? Early death. Did you know the Bible teaches you can die before your time? Did you know that? And not enough of you knew that. Go to Ecclesiastes 3. I like to edify the saints. Go to Ecclesiastes, the third chapter. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, I want you to see this right from the Bible. I remember I did a health meeting. I was invited to a church of 4,000 members. It's a big Baptist church. They had me come there because they wanted me to teach their congregants about health and the gospel. And I know that a lot of people don't live healthy and eat healthy because they always say things like, well, you got to die from something. I might as well enjoy the ride. So, you know, I, I quoted them this verse. I, I quoted Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and I want you to see what the Bible says as we look at verse 2. Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 2, are you there? It says in Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 2, there is a time to be born and then a time for what else? A time to die. So a lot of people adopt the attitude. They say, well, you know, it, 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 when it's my time to die, it's my time to die. Whether I got a steak in my mouth, a pig in my mouth, or a gun in my mouth. It's like, it doesn't matter. When it's my time to die, it's my time to die. And I said, well, hold on. Before you conclude that thought, let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. So now let's go to chapter 7. And then when you look at Ecclesiastes chapter 7, this shed some light. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, look at verse 17. In Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 17, the Bible says, Be not overmuch wicked, neither be thou what? Foolish, for why will you die when? Before your time. How can you die before your time? Practicing wickedness and being foolish. That's why the top of the pyramid says early death. It's because we picked up bad habits, we were practicing bad things, and over time, it took its toll. And so God says, deliver my people from that. Also, here are some negative spiritual impacts of unresolved trauma. We have negative effects of trauma can spill over in an individual's belief system and cause devastating faith-based doubts. What are some of them? An example, God doesn't listen to me anyway, so what's the point? Do you know a lot of people say that because of how people treat them? Because people treat us this way, we immediately associate it with God. We say, well, people don't listen to me. I guess God's not listening to me either. Then, I thought God was enough, but I still don't feel okay. This is why, this is why, and I, I, I can't tell you how important this is. Feel. This world is about to implode over the reality that they're teaching. This school, schools all over, places everywhere are teaching. If you feel it, it's the truth. We can apply that principle to a lot of stuff going on. But a lot of a, a, a general teaching born from the heart of Satan is to tell the world, if you feel it, then it is the truth, even if you're 12. 
even if you're eight. Do you feel that way? Yes, I feel that way. Well, it's the truth. And as a government, we're going to get in the way even of your parents. It's destroying society. The Bible says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. That's like completely different than what the world is dishing out right now. Jesus says, if you want to come after me, you're going to have to deny how you feel. Proverbs 14 and verse 12 says, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Why are you trusting your feelings? Why are you saying because you feel it is the truth? We act like we don't have a deceitful heart. That's why I'm telling you, the answer is not legislation. The answer is the gospel. That's how we're going to solve a lot of problems in society, it's through the gospel. Well, how do we solve this problem? I mean, we, we have a problem. I mean, traumas hit the great grand majority of us in society. How do we solve this problem? Well, I want to introduce to you somebody. His name is Jesus. Jesus is our suffering Messiah. Did you know that? He's not just our Messiah. He's our suffering Messiah. When that Lamb of God, when he decided, I'm going to come down and I'm going to save humanity, I want to show you how low he was willing to go. The Bible says in Matthew 1 and verse 23, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Listen, just for Christ to leave heaven and to come down on earth was a big sacrifice. Just that. Just that alone. If I said to any of you, hey, how many of you want to go to Hawaii for one month, all expenses paid to do mission work? I already covered it with your bosses. Your boss said it's fine. All you need to do is say yes. If I came to you and I said, Hawaii, we're sorry, but we're going to have to put you on a beach house. So you'll be right next to the beach. We're really sorry about that. Um, you know, you're going to have people serving you hand and foot. Uh, you're going to have a, a, a whole conglomerate of food that you won't know what to choose because there'll be so much. And you're only going to do your mission work from pretty much 9 to 5, and then after that, we're going to go ahead and take you in the sights, and you'll begin to see all sorts of beautiful things on the wonderful island of Kauai or the big island or wherever. So how many of you are going to go on this mission trip? I just want to see your hand. Y'all going? All right, good. Now, obviously, I'm intriguing you because of all the beauty that's connected to this mission. But what if I said, hey, folks, we're going to go to uh, Israel. And we're going to go do some mission work out there. Uh, right now, the reports are coming back that every Christian that goes in comes back home in a box. And, you know, the chances are that you are, you are going to die. Um, we have a very brick structure that you're going to be staying in, very cold at night. We'll be sleeping on a concrete floor, and you will have bricks for your pillows. Ants will typically crawl across your stomach. You might get bit a little bit and suffer some degree of poisoning, but we have some, you know, uh, serum that will help you out with that. Your food is basically bread, beans, and oranges, and that's it. If I were to say, how many of us want to go? Exactly. Way less hands, right? Now, Jesus knew I'm entering into a war zone. Just the fact that he was in a place that was, it was indicative of peace. Heaven is a place of peace. Just for him to say, I'll come down and live on earth, he knew I'm going to enter literally into a war zone. That alone was a sacrifice, but that wasn't low enough for Jesus. He says, no, I love doing too much. I can't, I can't, I got to go lower. So what else does Jesus decide to do? The Bible continues. It says, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a what? Servant and was made in the likeness of what? Men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So Christ didn't just decide to come to earth. He decided to go lower and take on our nature. He says, I'm going to be just like you. I'm going to take on your weaknesses and take on your challenges. Jesus says, this is what I'm willing to do so that I can relate to you. Have you ever noticed the people who reach you most are the people who can relate to you? Have you ever noticed that? 
You see, if Jesus would have come living like some king above all temptation, he can't minister to me. And he can't minister to you. This is why the Bible says very clearly, wherefore in how many things? Are you sure you're reading right? I mean, I just want to make sure, are you sure you're reading that right? Wherefore in how many things? It says, wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself has suffered being what? See, that's the difference. When we're tempted, we enjoy it. When Jesus was tempted, it brought pain. But it says he suffered being tempted. He is able to help or relieve them that are tempted. That's why Jesus, when he came, he said, I got to take on your nature. I got to be susceptible to temptation just like you. Now watch this. The Bible says, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in how many points? In all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. I have heard so many people say, I had a young lady, I was studying with her, right? And this is where we're about to kind of get a little deep, but it's biblical. I had a young lady come to me one time. I was studying with her. Used to be in the church. She left. Did what she wanted to in the world. But now she was willing to make a step to come back to the Lord. She said, Brother Dwayne, she says, I need you to explain something to me. I was trying to help her to see that God is good. She said, I need you to help me with something. I said, how can I help you, sister? She said, I was at a conference. Several boys grabbed me and took me to a room and gang raped me. She said, I was crying out to God to help me. But it's evident he didn't show up. She said, how, how can I agree with you that God is good when that happened to me? And I'm a very honest man, so I told her, I said, sister, I said, it's not that I don't have a response, but I don't think I have a response that would prove satisfactory to you at this time. I need to pray about that. I could have said Psalm 145, 17, all the Lord's ways are righteous and stuff like that. That, that wouldn't have helped her. I knew that wouldn't have helped her. She was very sincere in asking that question. Today, however, if she would have asked me that question, I would say, so a group of men took you to a place you didn't want to go, and then they stripped you naked, which you did not want them to do, and then they did things to your body that brought them pleasure while it brought you pain, and you wanted to be delivered from it, and no one delivered you. She was like, right. I said, you know, Jesus, one day a group of men took him to a place he didn't want to go. They stripped him naked. Michelangelo was very kind when he put the painting of Jesus covering his loins. Jesus was naked on the cross. He endured that shame. Jesus was taken to a place he didn't want to go. They stripped him naked, which he didn't want them to do. They did things to his body that brought them pleasure while it brought him terrible pain, and no one delivered him. I said, Jesus knows the pain that we've gone through. He's familiar with the traumas that we have faced. And I have to admit, I never thought about the story of the gospel like that, that Jesus entered into our traumas to save us. Is that biblical? Well, let's take a look. Because Jesus fulfilled prophecy by becoming our suffering Messiah, he can relate to my experiences of suffering when I went through abandonment, when I went through betrayal, when I went through physical and emotional abuse, when I went through rejection, 
And when we go through even the sense of sin, guilt, and shame. I never knew that Christ was willing to be so sacrificial of himself that he says, I will go through their traumas so that they will see. Because remember, we always connect to people better who have gone through what we went through. You see, what a lot of people are looking at Jesus today is saying, how can he, can, how can he relate to me? How can he connect with me when I've gone through this nasty stuff? Where is it that he can show that he was there and he knows what I'm feeling and knows what I went through? So I go through the Bible, abandonment, Matthew 26, 56. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Do you understand the disciples was his family? Literally, that was his family. And right there at the time, he needed his family most. His family, who made promises, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. They might, but I won't. Can you imagine? I wonder if there's anybody here who's had family that gave you assurance, I will never betray you. I will never forsake you. And the next thing you know, what happened? And when we go through that experience, when we go through that pain, Christ says, let me comfort you. Because I know exactly how that feels. Because I went through abandonment at the most crucial state of my life on earth, where I needed my people. And they left me. Christ went through that so that he can connect with those of us who have gone through abandonment. Not only that, Betrayal, Luke twenty two forty eight, 48. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou me with a kiss? Can you imagine that he's showing a sign of respect, love, and adoration when all along he was betraying him? Christ says to every husband who's been betrayed by his wife, Christ says to every wife that's been betrayed by your husband, Jesus says, I know exactly what it feels like to be betrayed when they're trying to act like they love you. And all along, here it is, this is what they were doing. Not only that, physical and emotional abuse, Mark 15, 19, and they smote him on the head with a reed and did spit on him, and then here goes the real serious injury, and bowing their knees, worshiped him. You know what this is? This is the angry man who comes home and slaps his wife and then says, I did it because I love you. You ever heard these crazy stories? Brothers be beating up on their women and then literally be like, you know I love you, but you just get me so upset sometimes. It's like one minute you're beating them up and then the next minute you're talking about, I love you. Can you imagine? They're beating Jesus up. When it, when it says they smote him on the head, if you look it up in the Greek, it means they did it repeatedly. So they're literally pop, pop, pop. They're just hitting him on his head over and over and over again. They're beating him in his head. And then after they beat him in his head, then they say, hail, king of the Jews. Do you understand what type of emotional abuse that was? And Jesus took it. Remember, Christ could have blinked his eye and turned everybody into dust. So that means he voluntarily took this. He took it. In fact, the Bible says alone, right there in a precious little book, a documentary on, on, the, on the life of Jesus called Desire of Ages, it says alone he suffered abuse and mockery from wicked men. This is what Jesus went through. This is very traumatic stuff. Not only that, Rejection. Rejection. In Mark 8 and verse 31, the Bible says, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected. It says, be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Do you know the role of the chief priests and the elders? The chief priests and elders were like father figures. They were like father figures. It says, for every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. 
who can have compassion. This is what priests were supposed to be, walking examples and walking models of compassion. It says, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. They were supposed to be very compassionate, nurturing people. Same thing with elders. And from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Literally, the elders and the high priests were like father figures to the people. So imagine feeling the rejection of a father. Imagine a father that makes you feel you're not good enough for my time. I'm not available. We have a crisis sometimes of unavailable dads. But this is exactly what Jesus was going through. Unavailable. He already lost his earthly father, Joseph. Praise the Lord, he had his heavenly father. Not only was rege Jesus rejected by the chief priests and elders, but the Bible says in Luke 17, 25, but first must he suffer many things and be rejected of the whole generation. The whole generation rejected Jesus. Jesus went through horrible, terrible rejection. And you sit back and you say to yourself, Jesus, why did you go through all of this? He said, because I want to be able to connect with the people that when, not if, when they go through trauma, there will be someone who says, I went through trauma, but I did not let it control me. You see, Jesus went through the sense of sin, guilt, and shame. The Bible says, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. So Jesus sensed the guilt of sin because he became sin for us. When it comes to guilt, the Bible says, and when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. And then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he, that's Christ, was condemned, guilty, he repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. You see, God turns his face away from sin. You read that in Isaiah 59. It says, he turns his face away from sinners. When Jesus took on your sin and my sin, he's literally standing before God now. Our guilt. That's why he said, my God, my God, why have you what? Forsaken me. You see, we're used to God not being with us. We're so used to it. But Jesus, from his eternity past up until the cross, was always with the Father. I remember when my child was very young, and I like a little, little baby, like one-year-old. And all they knew from daddy, all they knew from daddy was this. Hey, hey, little buddy. Hey, come here, little guy. Ooh, look at that. And all, that's all they knew. So one day, my son picks up a pencil that was on the ground. My son grabs that pencil. And my son hits me in the ankle with that pencil. And this is what I did. Ow! And I said, no, 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 you can't do that. No. And you know what my child did? My child was like this. And made the little ugly face, right? Did the little cry and everything. I thought about it. Why, why did they cry? And it was the first time that my child saw displeasure on my countenance. And it affected him so emotionally that he cried. I didn't hit him, didn't spank him or anything. All I did was say, no, 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 can't do that. He wasn't seeing the, hey, he was saying, no. And all of a sudden he's crying. You see, for us, we're so used to being separated from God that to a large degree, we've lost our sensitivity to the fact that he's displeased with some of our actions. But Jesus, John 8 and verse 29 says, he says, I always do those things which pleases my father. Therefore, I know he's with me. The whole life of Jesus was me and the father are one. So for the first time in his existence, 
he becomes sin. And now the father who loves to look at his face, the father must now turn his face away from sin. He did that for you. And it was killing him. This is what made the blood vessels pop in his head and mix with the sweat. It was the pressure of feeling what guilty, unrepentant sinners will feel. This is what Christ was going to. So I'm serious. When, when it says he sensed, the, he, 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 he felt what sinners that are guilty are going to feel. This is what Christ is going through on Calvary. And you're like, Jesus, why did you go through this? He says, because I know I'm going to have a whole group of people that are going to sense guilt. I have a whole lot of people that's going to sense the, the results of their sins, and I don't want them to get crushed by it. I'll get crushed for them. <laughs> telling you, this is why we're going to spend eternity studying the amazing, wonderful love of God. So, concluding, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the what? The shame. You have no idea how shameful it was for Jesus to hang on a cross as a guilty sinner, though he was completely innocent, and he's there literally naked. That was some serious shame that was brought on him. And he did all of this for us. That's why it's so offensive to know the gospel and still intentionally just do whatever we want. Because we, 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 we haven't connected yet with the depth of sacrifice that's been made so that you and I could be free. Jesus did not die from the wounds on his side and from the crowns on his head. He didn't die from any of that. Jesus died from a broken heart, and the Bible teaches it. The Bible says in Psalm 69 and verse 20, reproach hath broken my heart. That's literally a messianic psalm. It's talking about the Messiah. He says reproach is what broke my heart. And then look what Jesus says, and I am full of heaviness, and I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. Anybody feeling a little lonely? Anybody feeling like there's nobody there who cares? Jesus says, I look for people to take pity. Couldn't find anybody. He says, and I look for people to comfort me. But he says, but I found none. Christ went through all of this. The difference between us and Jesus is not that we went through trauma. Christ went through trauma. The difference between us and Jesus is what we concluded from the trauma. We allowed ourselves to let the trauma control us where Jesus allowed the Holy Spirit to control him. He came out victorious. You see, what is reproach? Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach. To any people. So why did Jesus die? He died from a broken heart because of yours and my sins. Straight from the Bible. Now, while Christ was going through heaviness of heart and all these other things, what did Jesus say towards the close of his life? He says, hey, 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 wait a minute. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. You see, he was beat up by the world. He was wounded by the world. He was traumatized by the world. But the Bible says that I still overcame the world. The world did not overcome me. You see, this is our good news. This is where we get excited. This is like, all right. So Jesus went through nasty trauma. He went through horrible stuff like many of you and I have gone through. But he overcame. It did not overcome him. So now we run to Jesus and say, Lord, how did you do it? Because Jesus makes this promise. He says, to him that overcomes, will I grant to sit with me in my throne. How do we overcome? Even as I also overcame. This is why the gospel through the sanctuary is so absolutely important, beloved, because it shows how Jesus did it, and then it shows how you and I can do it. That's the beauty of this thing. Let me give you a sign so you can know, because remember, our hearts are deceitful. What is a sign of true healing and being free from our trauma? There are some people today that are still under the deception that they're free when they're really not. Because remember, the heart's deceitful, right? Can I show you the sign that we are healed from our traumas? Healed and free. When we realize we have been hurt, we are given a choice of healing or denial. It's a fact. 
if God has truly, look at carefully at this family, if God has truly put our past in the past, then we should be able to think about that painful experience of blank while feeling nothing but God's supernatural peace and joy. If every time you still reflect on your trauma, it's this renewal of pain, suffering, and darkness, and you got to almost go through a period of recalibrating your mind to even try to come back to normalcy, you're just not healed yet. It doesn't make you a bad person. It's just that you're not healed yet. When you're healed, when you're free, nothing but God's supernatural peace and joy when you reflect back on that thing. And here, let me, let me magnify this point. In revisiting the scenes of your trauma, we should be able to think about and focus on what God has done for us and not what some evil person has done to us. This is when you're free. You may not be there yet, and it's okay if you're not. You're not a bad person. It just means you still got the healing journey. That's all. But when you're healed, when you reflect back on that thing, all you can remember is what God has done. Your focus is what God has done for you through that drama. Not just rehashing the negative feelings of what some evil person did to you. Lastly, and we should also be free from the patterns we developed to protect ourselves. What patterns do you have right now of self-protection? Jesus lived a whole life of making himself vulnerable. He had barriers, but he still made himself vulnerable. If you're really healed, you'll make yourself vulnerable. You'll, it'll be possible to get hurt, but you're gonna be okay because you know who's with you and you know who you're with. Six things that Christ did to help him overcome his trauma, six things for you, and we're done. One. He recognized his nothingness and God being everything in the battle. Jesus literally said, I can of my own self do nothing. I mean, he leaned completely on the Father. He said, I am nothing. I can do nothing. So he recognized his nothingness and God being everything he needs in the battle. Two, he affirmed himself as one who is loved by God. Did you know there are some of us in the church right now, some of us who are in high places in leadership, even pastors, elders, deacons, deaconesses, uh, Song leaders, praise team leaders, musicians, I mean evangelists. There's so many of us that we are still not convinced that God loves us. It's kind of crazy. It's kind of messed up, but it's the truth. There's some of us that are even serving. And by action or confession, we still are not convinced that God loves us. We need to overcome that. Jesus affirmed himself as one who is loved by God. Number three, therefore, he would rest his case in an all-knowing, loving father. Jesus would always rest his case in the father. He would say, Father, you know what's going on here. I'm going to rest my case in you that you're going to do the right thing at the right time, and I'm going to remain in you right here. Number four, he focused more on prayer than his pain. He focused more on prayer than his pain. The Bible literally says, as he was going through agony, he prayed more earnestly. Jesus focused more on prayer than his pain. When you're going through pain, cry out. Cry out to God. You reach out to him. Number five, I love it. He knew his trial would result in a powerful soul-saving ministry. Some of you are going through darkness right now. And as you hang in there and God delivers you, he is going to use you very mightily to help deliver others. He's going to, he, some of us are going through some nasty stuff right now, but Jesus is very, he's preparing us. He's fitting us to do a great work and a very necessary work. His, he knew his trial would result in a powerful soul-saving ministry. And number six, he knew God would take care of the unrepentant. Jesus didn't have to focus on getting revenge because he knew that God's revenge is better than his. You see, you can get revenge, but God can get better revenge. So God says, don't you worry. That's why he says, you just love your enemy. You just pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. You know why God says that? Because God says, if they don't repent, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands 
of the living God. When God takes revenge, we might say, okay, okay, Lord, enough, enough. God is no joke when he decides to execute vengeance. That's why you love your enemy. That's why you pray for your enemy, because only one of two things. They're either going to be converted or they're going to be condemned. Question. How many of us understood our study today? Do we understand our study today? Do we see how Jesus is our suffering Messiah? Do we see how that Lamb of God, when he came, he was saying, look, I am so vested in delivering you that he says that I want you to understand that I'm going to go as low as possible into your experience so that I can deliver you. I'm making a very important appeal right now. There are some of us in this room that have been traumatized. I don't need to know and I don't want to know the specifics of your trauma. But there are some of us that might have been in the church for years, might have hold positions in different levels in the church, but you know that there are still some areas where your traumatic experiences still have government over us. And we want that real victory. Jesus really came to make us free. For whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And some of these wounds we suffered in our trauma has kept us down in these areas. It's like we have victory here, victory here, victory here, but still a slave here. Christ says, no, I want to deliver you from all things. And so my, my appeal is this. If you know that you have gone through some traumas in your life, that you know that to a degree, whether small or great, it still has government over me. But now that I see that Jesus was not only the Messiah, but he was my suffering Messiah, he has entered into my traumas, and now I can go to him more intimately and see how he can make me free. I'm wondering if that's you, would you be willing to stand to your feet and so recognize that I may have a word of prayer with you? I want to pray for you because these, this is a binding that's very strong, but God is able to deliver us. He's able to make us free. He's able to literally take the power of that trauma and its negative effects, and he's able to make us free. But we're just going to have to walk in his steps a little bit more. Now, in order to receive Jesus' power, you must receive Jesus. Jesus doesn't give power independent of himself. He gives the power along with himself. And so as you stand, I want you to know that Christ stands with you. And my hope and my prayer is that if you've never said, Lord, I accept you in my heart, I ask you to forgive me of my sins, and I pray that you might become the Savior, not just of the world, but the Savior of my life. That I'm going to say that prayer right now, and I just want you to say it with me in your heart, and as you do that, I want you to know that you are leaving here different than when you came in. And I say to God be the glory. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I just want to start this prayer by recognizing that there may be some in this room who have never made a decision to accept you, never made a decision to accept Jesus in their lives because possibly their trauma was holding them back. But they learned a little something. Now, they got to go, they got to walk with you, Lord, from this study, but they learned enough to say that I'm willing to give God a try. Lord, I'm praying for that precious soul that they might join me in this prayer to just say, Lord, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Lord, I pray that you might please come into my heart I pray that you will clean up my life and help me to overcome even my trauma, that I might live full and free for thee, and that I will become a witness to those who know you not, so that they can partake of truly this good news. If any of you have said that prayer with me, then I want you to know you have truly passed from death to life. You have gone from dirty to clean, and now all Jesus wants you to do is live and stay clean. Lord, please bless us. Help us to be free from the traumas that we have just uh, faced and ha has been controlling us, dear God. And I pray that as we are free, help us to go tell somebody else and to do it for others. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We will now have our praise team come forward to close us out with the song.